Thank you so much, Rob. So when I said that, what I really meant was that I wasn't going and looking for accessibility conferences uh, to speak at this year. Um, this year for me is the year of design conferences and HR conferences, because when you're an accessibility expert and you speak at accessibility conferences, you're not convincing anybody. Everybody who's there already knows that accessibility is the right thing to do. So I'm kind of going where the non-believers are, um, but there is this controversy, and this is how we picked this talk uh, title, uh, about the use of overlays. Um, and I've published several articles on it. Nobody should be surprised by my opinion if you've read any of them. And the title of this talk is Overlays Are Not the Solution to Your Accessibility Problems. So first of all, a little bit about me. I am an accessibility architect at VMware. Um, I started the accessibility program there. I also started the accessibility program at McDonald's. So I work in fairly large um, organizations, usually going in when, where there's no accessibility program and setting an accessibility program up. I will do a disclaimer right now saying that this, art, this talk is all Sherry, okay? It's not about VMware uh, because I may say things that are contrary to what VMware customers are doing, and I don't want an email from my boss about it saying, why did you say that? Okay, so who am I? Well, first of all, I've got this weird multidisciplinary background. I started off with a degree in computer science. I practiced uh, software QA for about 10 years. And then I got asked to testify as an expert witness in a lawsuit that involved whether or not some software had been adequately tested. And I realized that tech people don't understand law, legal people don't understand software, and I decided to go to law school so I could be one of those people that translated for both worlds. And then about a decade after that, um, I got an MBA. But uh, during my third year of law school, we discovered that my daughter had a progressive hearing loss and I had intended to go into intellectual property and instead I ended up going into advocacy for the deaf. If uh, those of you who know me uh, may know me from uh, my blogs, I've been blogging on accessibility uh, for about two years now and I was named the Medium 2020 uh, UX Collective Author of the Year, which I'm quite proud of. Um, I am the leader of the uh, Disability at VMware Employee Resource Group. Um, I'm a keyboard only user and a magnification user. Uh, so I do both uh, simultaneously because of independent um, disabilities that I have. And also you can see me here in my uh, favorite activity, which is wheelchair archery. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm hoping to think a 2024 Paralympic hopeful. Uh, I'm, my score is almost 600, where 720 is perfect. Uh, I practice at least an hour and a half every day. Um, and it's the one thing that's really kept me going during the pandemic. So what are overlays? Well, first of all, overlays, in my mind, are uh, a problem that is looking for a solution. And the solution is fixing the code, the inaccessible code itself. The, the overlays are just another layer that sit between the user and the website that can cause even more things to go wrong. So overlays are kind of a catch-all term. Some, some people refer to them as overlays. Some people refer to them as plugins. I've also heard them referred to as widgets. You may have heard of a number of these companies in this list, uh, Accessibi, UserWay, AudioEye, EqualWeb, Max Access, User First, and True Abilities. So those are the most common overlays, and you may have heard of one of these. Um, I'm not picking on any one of these companies individually. Um, and in fact, one of these companies has been getting their lawyers to send out letters to people saying, stop saying bad things about us. I'm highlighting the issues that are presented by this solution as a category in general, not an individual um, vendor. Okay, so if you see a blue Vitruvian man type of uh, logo, 
with uh, that's off the side somewhere on a website, chances are that website is using an overlay um, because that is the symbol that almost every single one of these companies has chosen to indicate that that site has configured an overlay as an option for accessing the site. So as I mentioned, sometimes they're called accessibility tools or plugins or widgets. Um, they, they are aimed at improving accessibility. They always use third-party code. It's usually, but not always, JavaScript. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the front end behave better without actually changing the underlying code, okay? Doesn't actually fix the, the problems in the underlying code. And they are a forever thing. So you have to pay for these annually. And until you fix your code and eliminate the need for having an accessibility overlay, you're gonna be paying that fee every year because as soon as you stop paying that fee, you no longer have access to that third party JavaScript. So let's talk a little bit about how websites work and assistive technology works without overlays. First of all, you've got your user who's sitting at a computer. Then you have some form of assistive technology, and it can be many forms of assistive technology that people use concurrently. So some types include um, alternative input devices, screen readers. Uh, my daughter's personal favorite, uh, her Bluetooth uh, phone connected to her hearing aids, or some type of glasses, keyboards, other uh, things that people use. Then you've got your destination. Your destination is the website or the software that you're using. So the user first communicates through the assistive technology to the destination, and then the destination round trips the information through the assistive technology back to the user. So this is how it works when you don't have an overlay. Okay, this is without overlays, the assistive technology is entirely in the hands of the user. They control it. There can be, and usually are, especially with more experienced assistive technology users, very highly fine-tuned settings. Um, I have a previous coworker who has his speech rate on his screen reader set to 325%. I literally cannot understand what it's saying. I can understand most speech rates, but not this gentleman's. And with his screen reader and his braille note taker simultaneously, he can actually execute and interpret a Google query faster than I can. And I type almost 100 words a minute. So that is how highly each of these pieces of assistive technology can be tuned. For example, Apple has, I believe, 32 different um, settings in its accessibility options, and each one of them has several categories of things that can be configured. All of it without overlays in the hands of the users. That's really important. Okay, so what happens when you get overlays? Well, you still have the, the flow that I discussed earlier, the user the assistive technology in the middle and the destination with the round trip circle uh, going back and forth through the assistive technology with the control in the hands of the user. When you add an overlay to that equation, what happens is then the destination has an extra layer of communication that's going back and forth to the overlay. But the overlay also is trying to directly communicate with the user bypassing the assistive technology. And the user has very few uh, abilities to control the options that the overlay is presenting. So when you use an overlay, sometimes people's screen readers stop working. Sometimes people's alternative input devices don't work. If the overlay worked at 100%, that might be nominally accessible. The problem is they don't. So your assistive technology no longer works and you just have the overlay with the control being removed largely from the users. Okay, so 
overlays, one of the reasons why they've got such a bad reputation is because they make a lot of claims that are unsupportable. So these are actually screenshots that I made literally in the last week from some of the overlay websites. So one overlay claims it has best in class accessibility solutions to ensure your site is ADA and WCAG 2.1 compliant. The reality is there's no such thing as ADA compliant with respect to digital accessibility. The ADA attempted to adopt WCAG as its standard, and it was WCAG 2.0 at the time, because this was about eight years ago when that effort started, and the effort was abandoned under the Trump administration. So the ADA never officially adopted anything with respect to digital accessibility. All of the litigation that we've seen is actually the direct result of that because people are suing and what's happening is case law, okay, which is the legal term for the results of the lawsuits is what's driving the adoption of the WCAG standard, not the ADA. Okay, secondly, overlays claim that they're gonna protect you from litigation, okay? Protect your business from lawsuits, keep safe from lawsuits, comply with legislation. That, that's the claim from one of the overlay sites, okay? In reality, by late 2020, 10% of lawsuits that were being filed were against companies using overlays. So somebody asked a question in the chat before the window started, am I gonna mention um, Murphy v. Ibobs? So that is one of the large cases that's pending. And the reason why that's an important case is because Carl Groves is involved as an expert witness in that case and has written um, an extensive um, expert witness brief, which has been made public on the issues with the iBob's website with the overlay applied on top of it. Another significant overlay case that's pending right now is, um, God, I don't remember the name of the plaintiff, but it's, but it's against ADP, the payroll company. And uh, that particular site uses audio eye. Um, and the reason why that's an important case is because uh, of it's not one of the standard serial plaintiff cases. Uh, it's actually, and it's also not one of the standard serial plaintiff lawyers. So it's a real uh, plaintiff with a, with a law firm that's known for litigating landmark accessibility cases, which means they're not gonna settle. They're not in it for the money. They're in it to, for the problem to be solved. Okay, so one ADA defense attorney commented that the presence of an overlay icon on a website sends a signal that the organization really hasn't done anything meaningful about site accessibility, and that attracts plaintiff's attorneys like honey attracts ants. So by using an overlay, you're actually hanging a great big sue me sign. And the reason for that is because the overlays don't make your site compliant. And there's a number of ways that I'm gonna review in the next section about how that's just not possible using the uh, current technology. So in the small print in the contracts, the overlays highlight things that they can't make accessible. Okay, so the list here includes flash, which thank God isn't supported anymore but that doesn't mean that it's not still uh, out in public. It can't make Java accessible. It can't make Silverlight accessible. It doesn't remediate PDF files. So anything that you have that has a download, it's not trying to fix the downloads. Those will still be inaccessible unless you fix them yourself. They can't remediate Canvas. They can't remediate SVG, and a lot of images are displayed using SVG. They can't do captions for podcasts. They can't do captions or described audio for videos. And there's a lot of modern state-changing UI frameworks, such as React and Angular, that it also doesn't remediate any of those. That's a whole lot of stuff in the fine print that can't be fixed by uh, any type of uh, overlay at this point. 
Okay, so let's go back to my favorite picture here, which is me shooting at my archery target. Okay, let's look at the automated description for that picture. The auto-generated alt text was a picture containing tree outdoor wood. Okay, okay, it's outdoors. There's some trees, trees have wood. Okay, but that's not what the picture is about. The picture is about me participating in wheelchair archery. There's nothing about a person being in a picture. There's nothing about archery or arrows in the picture or the archery target or the hay bales or the wheelchair or even the um, kind of uh, country quiver that I use, uh, which is a, a traffic cone I stole from the side of the road. Um, AI generated images are not going to be an equivalent experience for people with disabilities. They get it right occasionally for simple pictures, but more often than not, they get it wrong. Okay, let's take another instance of uh, something that uh, related to pictures. Let's say this picture came with the following text. Sherry Byrne Haber, an archery Paralympic hopeful, practices her shots against hay bales for two hours every day at 40 meters distance. Okay, what happens is that makes the picture decorative. The paragraph covers everything that needs to be there. And the, the picture should be flagged as decorative so that screen readers skip over it and don't uh, mention the picture at all. AI can't figure out yet what pictures are decorative and what pictures are not. So even if the overlay could generate the appropriate description for this picture, which it can't, um, but even if it is accurate, it's supposed to be suppressed. The presence of any alt text will be redundant and will slow down the screen reader and is highlighted as a requirement for, for the alt text guideline under WCAG. Another thing that comes up uh, with respect to images that overlays can't handle is skeuomorphic images. So let's say uh, you have a record button, right? And everybody knows uh, that the record button on most devices is visually displayed as a filled circle inside uh, a hollow circle. What's the AI generation gonna do? It's gonna say filled circle inside hollow circle maybe, or it might say two circles. What it's not saying is record. For skeuomorphic images, the important thing is not what the image looks like, but what the image represents. The, you know, a shopping cart uh, represents a, a list of things that you wanna purchase. It's not actually a cart, even though that's what the picture is. So, those kinds of icons, again, not possible to do under current technology. Okay, let's talk about header structure. So header structure is another thing that's really, at this point in time, impossible to remediate. So let's say you have the following header structure. You have H1, which is dogs, H2, which is hounds, which is a type of dog, and H3, Irish wolfhound, I grew up with an Irish wolfhound, they're my favorite dogs, a type of hound, okay? That is a valid header structure. But let's say somebody makes a mistake and H2 gets deleted and you've only now got H1 and H3, okay? That's a WCAG violation. You can't skip levels, okay? So that's just at face value, you have to accept that. Question is, what is an overlay going to do when it finds this type of mistake? Is it going to take the H3 and move it to H2, like promote it a level, which would be wrong? Or can the overlay figure out that you're missing a category and fill it in, which is actually going to result in more correct behavior, but it can't be done at this point. So these types of errors can't be solved. Uh, by overlays. Okay, so you've got other issues when you use overlays, uh, one of which is that overlays can present a security and a performance issue. So remember, you've got the destination communicating with the overlay. 
um, we we took that. That's the uh, image from when I was explaining uh, how uh, assistive technology works in the presence of overlays. Okay, but the overlay itself is on a different website. So you have a line of code in the, that you have to insert in the destination that calls uh, the functions on the overlay on the overlay server. So it's a different system, which can be hacked and can have performance issues. Now, the problem is that your users don't see this communication happening with the overlays. It all happens behind the scenes. So to the users, it might as well be that the overlay is not there and any experience that they have with being hacked or the performance issues looks like it, you, it's your fault and not the overlay's fault because the overlay behavior uh, on the server side is invisible to the users. So what do the accessibility experts have to say? WebAIM just recently released its third accessibility practitioner survey where they added a question on this go round. How would you rate the effectiveness of web accessibility overlays, plugins, or widgets that automate accessibility changes in web pages? So 3% of respondents said that they were very effective. Okay, 27% said somewhat effective, 32% said not effective, and 37% said not effective at all. So 69% of respondents said that overlays don't work. They said they weren't effective or they weren't effective at all. So over two thirds say that they're ineffective. And if you just look at accessibility professionals that have disabilities, which they also asked the question on the um, survey so that they could uh, extract that information, uh, almost 75% said uh, of accessibility professionals with disabilities. So people with disabilities that are accessibility experts say that it's actually worse than people without disabilities who are accessibility experts. And the people with disabilities who are accessibility experts are the ones that are most likely to have actually had been forced to interact with an overlay. So what do the users say? There is a website uh, that I'm pointing to people at the top. I'm not gonna read all the text on this page, but it's called overlayfactsheet.com. And so this is a website uh, that people have put comments about what they feel about overlays. And there are a list of accessibility professionals. I am one of them uh, stating that we will never use an overlay and we do not support the use of overlays. So I would recommend uh, that if you haven't gone to this page before, uh, that it is worth mentioning uh, to that this site exists. Uh, because what, uh, what this talk is about is I'm basically trying to give you uh, the responses for when somebody asks you in your organization, why are we spending so much money on accessibility when we could just use one of these overlays? Okay, what do users say about them? Well, there is, oops, sorry. There is now a uh, website called Accessa Bye Bye. Um, and it is put out uh, by a college student uh, who has figured out how to block um, accessibility overlays. So remember going back to the slide where I talk about uh, how the to communicate between the destination and the overlay. If you know the identities of the servers that the overlays are using, you can block them. Um, and so that is uh, something, and there's actually some interesting statistics if you go to um, accessibyebye.org um, that it tells you which sites it is blocked and which overlays that they're using. So there's some interesting um, analytics there. And uh, there is a, a list uh, at overlayfactsheet.org um, called additional reading. And the additional reading contains links to articles uh, that people have published uh, talking about uh, you know, some pros, but mostly cons of using, uh, access, uh, using overlays. 
Um, so there was, uh, are there some questions in the chat now? Rob? I am not seeing any questions, Sherry. Okay, somebody had asked a question before about uh, the IBOBS case. Correct, correct, and you did mention that. Right, so that had to do with uh, prescription glasses at optometry office, and what's happening with the AI uh, generated software is they're not describing the glasses in any level of specificity, and, and those descriptions are important. It was also missing information about uh, sales uh, and, and other things that would have been uh, crucial to know for an end user who was a screen reader user that was visiting that site. Um, it, the ADP case, I can't even begin to describe how frustrating that is. So I personally started talking to ADP about their accessibility issues six years ago. Um, and it had to do with the fact that one of my employees uh, was legally blind and could not access his paycheck stubs, which he needed to do to prove his income uh, for a new rental. Uh, this also came up uh, again later on uh, in a different context where uh, somebody I know was being asked to produce paycheck stubs to uh, prove employment uh, as part of a background check for a new job. And he couldn't get those paycheck stubs off of ADP because ADP wasn't accessible. Instead, so ADP knew it had a problem, but instead of solving the problem the right way by fixing their code, they, so they solved it by installing uh, an overlay, um, solved in air quotes. So um, that, that case, I believe that between those two cases, I, I, you know, I don't know which way they're going to go. Uh, courts can always do things that you don't expect. Uh, but if the defendants lose those cases, they may not be able to recover their money against the overlay companies because there's all kinds of exclusions in the fine print that uh, prevent them from doing that. But that would send a very strong message to the business community that overlays are not gonna get you out of accessibility lawsuits. Now, when I say courts do funny things, I did not expect uh, the decision in the Winn-Dixie case that came out last week. Um, I think that it's being perhaps blown a little bit out of proportion in that it's a very small circuit and there are still more levels of appeals uh, that are available. So I'm not too concerned yet about that case. I think it's a blip in the road, just like the decision, the mid-level decision in Domino's was a blip in the road. And we need to wait until that one is fully litigated before we can draw any conclusions about what it means to accessibility in general. Okay, so uh, looks like questions are starting to come in, but I can't quite read them fast enough. Please tell Sherry best of luck in the Paralympics. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm getting quite serious about it. Um, obviously, I got into it too late uh, for this year, um, but uh, 2024 is going to be my year, I think. Sherry, we have another question on what is your take on why overlays are popular? when the need to do this correctly is overstepped? So they're cheap, okay? You know, 500 bucks a year compared to running a whole accessibility program. They're easy. Um, you don't have to get your whole IT department involved. You just need to get one person to put that single line of code in. But inevitably, the person who's making the pro, the pro overlay decision uh, is not a person with a disability. When a person with a disability is making the decision, overlays don't happen. Um, so I think people are looking for, for an easy out and they, they seem to think that this is one, but you know, I'm here to tell you that it isn't uh, because of all the things that I outlined that it can't fix, because of all the things that I outlined that just aren't ready for prime time yet in terms of 
providing e an equal experience. And the only way to solve your accessibility problem is to surprise solve your accessibility problem organically, which is fix the code. Thank you, Sherry. We have another question. The general perception of overlay users is that overlays may or may not help screen readers use screen reader users, but options like translation, color contrast settings, etc., offered by the overlay is useful for many others who need them, might want to use them. What would be your thoughts on that? So those things are not necessarily required by WCAG. And the problem is that they're making the situation worse for things that are required by WCAG. So to one extent, I see the benefit, especially for older individuals who might not have their own plugins, who might not have configured their own assistive technology, who might not even be using assistive technology, that want you know, to see the, the, the big A so that they can press on it and, and make the screen bigger instead of knowing that you're supposed to do control plus plus. Um, but on the other hand, when you're taking over all assistive technology and substituting it with your own behavior, that's not acceptable because people have spent a lot of time and a lot of money configuring their assistive technology the way they want it and that shouldn't be blocked. Thank you. It looks like we have one more question. Accessible websites, website themes that are actually accessible, where can I find them? Only if you know, I need to see places like Wix meet accessibility standards. So it wasn't until Wix was threatened with an accessibility lawsuit that they began to provide accessible themes. And so Wix does have a few accessible themes. The ones that I typically go to though, are the WordPress accessibility plugins, or sorry, the Word, WordPress accessibility uh, themes. They have, I think 80, maybe a hundred on their website. So accessibility is actually a flag that people can set their themes when they submit them to WordPress. Thank you for the person who posted the link. Um, you still have to check them, okay? You still have to make sure that your content is accessible. If you post an uncaptioned video to an accessible WordPress theme, you just broke your accessibility. Okay, because remember, there's two parts to accessibility. There's the infrastructure part, which handles the navigation and the behavior on the page. And then there's the content part. So I use a WordPress accessible theme. Uh, it's at sherryburnhaber.com. Sorry, I really can spell my name. There we go. That is one of the 80 uh, WordPress themes. Um, and then I make sure that all the content that I post to that site is also accessible. Any other questions that I can answer in the chat window? Looks would, like, I recom uh, would I yeah. recommend the use Sorry, of Sherry. overlays along a clean, accessible website? At this point in time, no, uh, because there is no overlay that, that doesn't take over and break other people's assistive technology. I think that you can put in things uh, that are not overlays that would help uh, with your color contrast and magnification issues. I think that's the same person who asked that question earlier, um, but I would not uh, put in an overlay at this point to anything. I used to say that if you were actively remediating, that an overlay might be accessible or might be acceptable for a short period of time, um, but I've actually backed off uh, from that position uh, because I've, I've seen the overlays um, and they just interfere too much with other people's working assistive technology. Anything else that I, you know, you can, you can find me on Medium, you can find me on LinkedIn. 
I have a unique last name. All of the Bernhavers on this planet are either me or people I gave birth to. So uh, not hard to find. What would be the best way to make convince organizations to make a clean, accessible website while attending to others' needs like magnification, translation, et cetera? That's a whole nother talk, but I'll give you a few uh, highlight points, uh, which is uh, number one, you need to have employees with disabilities, okay? If you don't have employees with disabilities, you don't have people internally who are continually bringing up these issues. You don't want all of your employees with disabilities to be on the accessibility team because accessibility teams tend to be fairly small. VMware has a huge accessibility team and we have 16 people. Most, most organizations, their accessibility teams are one or two. Some people subcontract all the work out. They don't actually have an accessibility team. So, um, so that's important uh, to have employees with disabilities. Um, the second thing is obviously user research. Remember when you're doing usability research, it's a curb cut. Okay, you're benefiting both people without disabilities, but you're drastically improving the experience for people with disabilities. So do user research to prove that the that the site needs to be simple. It needs to be frictionless. You know, nobody stays on a website because it's got cool parallax. Um, people just want to buy stuff, get their things done and move on to the next thing that they have to do. So for clean, I recommend usability research uh, and a structured user research program. For accessible, make sure that you're doing your user research, including people with disabilities. So have specific targeted user research, for example, for people over age 65, for people who have hearing loss, for people who have vision loss, for people who are screen reader users or switch users, have cohorts uh, representing those disabilities as part of your overall user research. Or at a bare minimum, at least ask your user research participants whether or not you have a disability. So um, interesting side story, since I've got a few minutes. Um, there was a program that I was working on uh, that it was a, a program that provided training to women who'd been outside of the workforce. And so I asked them, how do you handle users with disabilities? And they said, oh, well, you know what? We haven't had any complaints, so we must be okay. Well, when we actually looked at uh, the people who were passing the course versus the people who were failing the course, one eighth of the people failing the course, so 12% identified as having a disability. The failure rate for people who are passing the, sorry, the, the rate of people with disabilities for people passing the course was 3%. So four times as many people with disabilities were failing the course as were passing the course, okay? That's when you know you have an issue, even though nobody's ever told you that you have an issue. That tells you you have an issue. Okay, and there's a Q&A now. Am I familiar with Recite Me? If so, any thoughts? Yes, I am familiar with Recite Me, and there's a number of other things like Recite Me. Um, I'm okay with those because those don't block screen reader usage. They're, they're basically an available substitute um, for somebody who might have vision issues, but who probably doesn't use a screen reader. That might be somebody like me. Um, Recite me, some people call it the OG of um, overlays, you know, the original gangster, um, because it's existed for the better part of 20 years, I think at this point. The reason why, it's not a problem is because it doesn't block anything. It provides something as an addition. I think if you're providing things as an addition, like the, the font increasing or the color contrast changing or even maybe spacing changes, uh, then as an addition, it's fine, okay? As a substitute, it is not. Okay, um, any other questions? You know, I'm, I'm will, you know, we've got like five minutes left. I'm willing to open it up to any accessibility questions at this point, not just overlays. 
Looks like we're Sherry, where can what you said about the no complaints be found to cite? I thought it was a great point, and I hear the there have been no complaints statement all the time. So I have an article somewhere. Um, maybe somebody can Google my last name and the phrase logical fallacy. Um, there are no complaints is a logical fallacy. If you don't make something accessible, you don't get those users and they don't complain. Getting complaints is a sign that you've actually done something right. Uh, somebody asked me at a VMware um, All Hands once, what would I consider a victory? And I, and I told the story. Uh, we took some products. We made them accessible. We did not advertise that we had made these products accessible. And two days after we made them accessible, I got my first complaint. Okay, Somebody pinged me online and said, hey, when I was using X, Y, and Z, I found this issue buried deep, you know, like five layers down into the product. Okay, One person might look at that and go, oh my God, that's a bug. You failed. Okay, The way I look at that um, is that I succeeded because the person got far enough along in the process to find a bug. We were no longer excluding them outright from participation. They could participate. They found an issue. We fixed the issue. Um, so to me, bugs are success. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Lissa, for, for pulling up that article. That's one of my favorite articles. I was in a bad mood that day. Um, I write uh, some of my best articles I write uh, are when I'm in a bad mood. So um, in this article, I break down all the different types of uh, anti-accessibility sentiment that you may see in your business place and how to counter those. And the, lot, the no complaints uh, being a logical fallacy is one of them. Yes, Adrian Roselli, oh my God, anything he writes is worth framing. Uh, same, th same thing with Carl Groves. So Adrian has been keeping a detailed blog of all of the issues um, he has seen and experienced with overlays and also all of the conversations he's had with the overlay companies. Uh, and, and some of them are quite enlightening. All righty then. Um, once again, I appreciate the invitation uh, to come here and talk to you about this. I hope I've uh, found some new converts along the way who can now go back and carry this message uh, when it is brought up. Uh, you know, why are we spending so much money on accessibility? Why don't we just use one of these overlays? Now you know how to counter uh, that argument with why overlays are don't improve accessibility in a lot of cases, actually make things worse and uh, just really are not the right solution for the problem. Awesome, Sherry, thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your, your perspective on this and uh, your time and putting this together for, uh, for our conference. Thank you.